I thought you said they're the same. They are the same. So if Jesus is, basically your, your philosophy is that Jesus and God are the same, which is a philosophy that developed along, along with Christianity slowly but surely, like in the Gospel of John. So if Jesus and God are the same, then you'll go back to Jesus. If you're pure in heart and you want to serve him 100%, if you have selfish desires, then you're going to come back and try again. Reincarnation. Correct. And so you're convinced that you have done enough good that you're going to go be with Krishna. Is that correct? No. You're not convinced. You hope. Yeah. And so does he judge you for those things? Obviously he must. He, he does not necessarily like it, but he understands that I'm sincerely trying to improve myself. Would you consider yourself to be a good person? Yeah, correct. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have you ever stolen anything? See, the thing you got to understand... You can judge a person by their goals. A good person is someone who has a high, a high goal. A bad person is someone who doesn't have a high goal, necessarily. Let's say I'm, I consider myself a good person because my ultimate goal is to be a pure servant of God. Now, if I, my goal was just to, to exploit others, then I wouldn't consider myself a good person. Now, I may not be perfect yet, but my goal is high, and I'm sincerely trying my hardest to get there. They, they seem to contradict in my brain that you do wrong, that makes you not perfect, but somehow Krishna, over, he just look, overlooks those things because you're striving for him. Is that right? Can I explain it in the context of our uh, our food, actually? Sure. Kind of interesting. See, with eating, we, every person has to eat. And in order to eat, you have to somehow or another exploit your environment. You have to take something from the ground. You have to, you know, some people even kill animals. Some people just eat plants and things like that. But ultimately, you're always you're taking something and you're killing something. So therefore, you're always you're always exploiting something and you're eating, correct? Now, if we do that for a selfish motive, to completely selfish motive, then then we get the reaction of that because I want to take what I want to take. Now, if we do that instead, reaction that's your karma, correct? That's my karma. So instead, the the thing is, if we do everything for the Lord, we cook for the Lord and offer our food to the Lord. If we if our attitude is just taking what we do, like eating, and making a nice preparation for God and offering it to Him, and then we take after He is taken, then what He does is He takes the responsibility for actions because all we're trying to do is sincerely serve Him. So the process, basic process of eating has to be there, but we dovetail it in a way that's a service to the Lord. So therefore, He takes responsibility. An example is given like in the army. A person may be fighting in a war... Hold, hold that analogy, because we got one that we need to chew on. No pun intended. But let, let me figure this one out first. All right? So do you believe that you have a pure heart? No. But in order to get to Krishna, you have to have a pure heart with pure motives, correct? Correct. So it sounds like you're not going to go be with him when you die. It sounds like you're going to be reincarnated. If I try my sincere hardest to serve the Lord, my heart will be purified. Are you trying your hardest right now? Correct, yes. But you haven't attained that pure heart yet. It takes a little while. So what about the bad things that you've done? How do those things get justified? They're not necessarily justified, but when you become, when you surrender everything to the Lord, He says, "Look, all the bad things are, of you have done pale in comparison to the surrender that you've shown me." So He takes responsibility and takes away those reactions. All right, now I want you to explain something to me. Then I'm a Christian. And I would say as a, as a Christian that Krishna does not exist, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, just like he said, all right? And I would denounce all of these teachings. It would sound to me then, based on what you've described, I would be in big trouble because I'm not pursuing Krishna, correct? Incorrect. Explain that. Like I said before, there's one God. We're just calling him different names, right? Correct. The challenge that I would have for you is how do you then put together the fact that, for instance, Islam and Christianity teach radically different things. Judaism teaches something radical from those two, and they're all monotheistic. It teaches something different than Buddhism and Krishna and Hinduism. It teaches something radical. How can they all be the same? What's radically different? Uh, Christianity from all of these religions. Radically different. How so? Well, you said before that you think that Christians just serve the Lord Jesus to, in order to get to heaven, correct? Well, my understanding, yeah. Okay, what do you, tell me what you think Christianity is. How does, how does a Christian get to heaven? Well, actually, let me ask you, what are the two main 
commandments that Jesus, Lord Jesus. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. How is that different than Islam? Uh, probably no different at all. How is that different than Hinduism? Where it differs, though, is those that that teaching might be the same. But the difference is, though, how one attains heaven. How do you think a Christian gets saved? By sincerely trying to follow the principles and serve Lord Jesus. See, that's that's wrong. See, the that, that's that's wrong. See, the Bible teaches something completely different. The Bible teaches that our heart is corrupt, that all sin, everybody, you, that fellow, even me, everybody, falls short of the glorious standard of God. All have sinned. Nobody does good. No, not one. Nobody is good. The heart is deceitful and corrupt above all things. And there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So it teaches that we're, our nature is corrupt and evil and at war with God, that we're enemies of God in our mind through wicked works. Now that, for starters, is radically different than what these other religions are teaching. So I was asking you before. Actually, it's not. Actually... That's that's not different at all. Okay. But now the difference, though, is you're striving to lose those imperfections so that you can be, if you will, perfect and be with Krishna, correct? Yeah. Here's what I think. That's not going to do you any good. That all of our righteous works, the Bible says, are like filthy rags. That our efforts for good are like filthy rags to God. We can't earn our way to heaven. That's what Christianity teaches. Have you read the book of James? Sure. There's quite a bit about how faith alone is dead, and you need to do good works. How do you? Right. That, that's that's really simple. Uh, it's really describing the same thing that Paul described, the same thing that Peter described, and Jesus described. A faith that is real will bear fruit. You can judge somebody's faith by their fruit. So if somebody calls themselves a Christian but they don't have any fruit, I can go, well, you're not really a Christian. That's all it's saying. Actually, I don't, I don't mean to debate. I'm going to get back and answer your question from our perspective again. Sorry. The thing about our striving for perfection is that that is, like you said, it's a way of our bearing fruit. It shows our sincerity. If you love someone, you're not going to be an idol, an idol lover. You're going you're gonna to try to do things for them. So if we love the Lord, we're going to try to do things for him. Now, it's not our endeavor that takes away our sinfulness or our, our impure heart, but it's, it's the Lord seeing our sincere efforts to try our best to serve him, that he sends his mercy, and that mercy is what brings us to that perfect stage of ser loving service with him. Okay. Again, that's different from Christianity. Okay, that's just different. And so when you, when you say that we're all the same... Of Christianity? Uh, the biblical form of Christianity. And it might, I might ask, too, I'm curious, too, if you think that we're all on the same path, then why aren't you a Christian? Why do you have to be a Christian? Why do, I don't know. Why have you chosen this one? Why aren't you? If it's all the same, why aren't you a Christian or a Muslim? Well, actually, after coming to this, I have more appreciation for Christianity. Now, the reason I'm not a Christian is because I've seen that these people, their processes and their attempts to serve the Lord are much more well-practiced than I, what I've seen in Christianity. But uh, it's not to denounce any Christians or anything. It's just saying the people, when I met these people, I saw they're living the scriptures. And that's, that's something that really struck me, you know. They're trying to live simple God-centered life, a humble God-centered life, which a lot of Christians do. But the philosophy and the... Uh, and the practices that these people do are doing the same thing, and they're doing it, for me, it, I connected with it more, and I've seen that they're more, I've just seen more earnestness to serve the Lord here. Do you know that Jesus said that if you don't call on his name, you will not inherit eternal life? Did you know that he said that? Yeah, correct. So they're at odds with each other, right? Did you know a Christian said that he is the source of everything? A Christian said what? No. Krishna says, Aham Sarvasi Prabhavo. Mataha Sarvam Pravartade, which means I am the source of all, of everything, all the spiritual and material worlds. So are they? So that wouldn't seem they're at odds with each other. It sure does. But if God is the same person, why can't then then they're not at odds with each other? If Jesus is God and Krishna is God, then they're not at odds at all. But Jesus didn't give us that option. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. There is only one name under heaven whereby man must be saved. It is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's different than Krishna. It's a different name. They're at odds. How do you justify that? We justify that by saying that... See, I don't know if I should go from your perspective or from my perspective. Basically, if you if you read the Greek of what you just quoted, it's a very present tense statement, extreme, described as extremely present tense. You know what that means, don't you? It's ongoing. No, that means that in the time and circumstances where Jesus was, he was the only pure teacher of this. Actually, I, I know for a fact in Greek, the present tense means it it's ongoing. It's a continuous. Sorry.
Well, I've heard many scholars that say differently. Sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> but anyways, the fact is that that similar statement is in the Bhagavad Gita, that in order to reach God, you need to have a pure teacher. Jesus was a pure teacher, and then there's many pure teachers in India and many pure teachers all over the world. So in order to reach God, you have to go through a pure teacher. And you're sure that Jesus isn't the only way to get to heaven? You're sure of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Okay, because you know that Christianity would then say you're condemned. You do know that. Yes, correct, I do that. And, but you're at peace with that. I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm very at peace with that. Okay, I'm going to ask you about, real quick, I want you to tell me four things. I want you to def- define Brahman, Karma, Dharma, and Atman. All right? Brahman. Brahman is the spiritual effulgence from the Lord. It's the spiritual what? Effulgence, the rays coming off the Lord. All right. Uh, is that what makes him, if you will, omnipresent? Yeah, correct. 